Hello, I am Rachel McLean, Community Relations Liaison with The Mather, a forward-thinking life plan community being developed in Tysons for those 62 and better. Our community is projected to open in 2023 and we are currently taking reservations. At The Mather, we recognize that art infuses our lives with vibrancy and meaning and we are so honored to be able to support the McLean Project for the Arts Meet the Artist series. Enjoy the conversation. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Emerson Gallery of the McLean Community Center. MPA is thrilled to have our galleries here and to invite you via links on our website or on social media for time ticket entry to come and really appreciate the art that we have installed. Meanwhile, I'm also thrilled to welcome you to day four of our Meet the Artist series. Cheryl Edwards, artist, teacher, and member of the Education Committee for the MPA Board is going to be interviewing two ArtFest artists, Susan Livingston and Julie Lansaw Warren. Thank you for being with us today. We hope you're enjoying the series and we invite you back. Hello everyone and welcome to MPA Art Fest Artist Talks. My name is Cheryl Edwards and I'm a local Washington DC artist. And I am here to introduce you to those of you that are new to MPA Art Fest. It's in its 14th year and the first year is a virtual festival. Um, MPA Art Fest brings art and community together, offering events, music, artwork, and much more. This year, we're thrilled to be exhibiting 52 artists. And I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to make sure that you go over to our website to see the virtual festival. Today, we have a very special artist with us, and her name is Susan Livingston, and she is a participant in the Art Fest. Hi, Susan, how are you doing? I'm fine, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm happy to be here with you. I would like for you to explain to us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your practice. Okay, I am a mixed media fiber artist. Um, at this time, I live in South Carolina. I've been here for a long time. Um, one of the things that South Carolina was known for a few centuries back was indigo. So indigo oh, is, yes, we used to grow. That was a major industry in South Carolina before tobacco and before cotton, before rice. So, and it was brought here by a 15 year old girl who lived in the West Indies. So it was an important crop for many reasons, including um, the fact that it was a young girl who brought it here. So indigo is part of what I use with my natural dyeing. I use a lot of other natural dyes too, and some of what a lot of people call kitchen dyes like avocado pits and onion skins, which are one of my very favorite. So then um, I knew when I started dying that it would always ha have to become something where I could take it beyond that. Um, I have been a stitcher, embroidery person for a lot of years. Um, and I feel like that is a very unique thing. I do all my stitching by hand. So... When I start stitching, it becomes something that is really completely mine. 
So I just keep going. So you would say that is where you can see the artist's hand when you apply that layer of stitching in your work. What I'd like to ask you, so I'm so intrigued about this um, indigo. Can you tell me how much of your work is influenced by historical references? Um, I, indigo comes from Africa, so that, that's why I'm asking this question in one piece. But in the other piece, I want to know what other historical references, if any, influence your work? Well, indigo does come from Africa, especially West Africa, I think. And it actually used to be a form of currency yes. where you could carry a lump of indigo in your pocket and use it for money. There's actually not very many areas that indigo wasn't grown. Europe, okay. not really. Uh, Japan is a very strong India uh, indigo culture, and they do something called shibori. Yes. And that is a lot of what I do. Can you explain to us what shibori is? A lot of people who are not in the textile world, they right. have heard that term, but they don't really know what that is. Well, when I am doing a piece of indigo and I think this napkin kind of shows it. Um, in this case, I have dyed the entire fabric, just a base color, very light. Then I fold it and I use what is called a resist and I clamp that okay. in place. And so when you do dyeing, and indigo is a very unusual dye, it is a fermented dye. Uh, whereas most other dyes that we use, you just put whatever material you have in water and you start heating it and you make your dye. Indigo requires a few more steps and it then requires a reducing agent and it gets to, when you look at your indigo pot, you see all these, this sheen of copper on top and bubbles. And when you dye with indigo, you very often do at least three or four 10 to 15 minute dips. So yeah. it's a very compliment, complicated um, dye process in comparison to other ways that you... Right. You don't just throw the fabric in the pot and let it go. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, can, you can you talk to us about, your process is fascinating. And there is a historical reference to Africa and as you say, to other parts. But what was surprising to me that, you know, indigo was grown in Carolina. That's a very surprise to me. But what I'd like to know, what is the subject matter of your work if, if any, do you, do you reference nature? Do you reference figures? Do you reference, what do you reference? Um, it just depends on what I'm doing at that time. What is behind me are three out of 48 nine foot panels that represents uh, an installation I did um, four years ago, I think, at a large art exhibition. Okay. And this installation is called Fragile Beauty, and it's reflective of the ocean. Okay. And so it was, these 46 panels were alternating, hanging from large frameworks that my son built for me. And we suspended them totally from a 16 foot ceiling which right there was a challenge. That sounds beautiful. Um, Can yeah. you tell us specifically about the works that are in the festival that are available for purchase and for viewing? Okay, um, one of the things I do, and I do a lot of, um, I'm doing a lot of napkins, uh, dinner napkin, that type of thing. I love to use vintage textiles. So you'll get a neat edge. Some of them might have a little embroidery motif that then becomes part of it. Um, I also have some tablecloths, some things like that. I also dye silk scarves. Um, 
This is one of my squares, for instance, and it's a different type of shibori. Um, actually, this is more similar to what we used to call tie dye. Or is that tie. silk? Is the material silk? Yes, all my scarves are silk. I love working with silk. So how difficult, I mean, how different is that from using um, linen or, or cotton? Well, linen and cotton takes a little bit more work um, because they don't, they are not as conducive to dyeing as silk and wool are. So they just take a little bit more of a process we call more danting um, to prep the fabric so that it's ready to really dye. Um, this little handbag is actually cotton and linen and so that's it that's available that's in the art fest this year yes it is the, it's a little um japanese inspired handbag that i make and then i do stitching on some of them um just very simple it is not a handbag that you're meant to carry everywhere and put your water bottle and your heavy book, and it's a, it's an occasion bag. Okay. So um, that's the type of thing. I also do mixed media fiber collages. And Those so are wonderful. The background is very often pieces that I've dyed. Um, and then I'll do some different things on them. I pick up things off the ground everywhere I, I go. The feather, yeah. Yeah, the blue jay feather. Um, and I feel like that's kind of honoring that creature. Part of that creature still lives. So I love to do these. Um, and then I do sometimes larger panels that also have stitching. So I will have um, a little bit of a variety of things. Okay, that will be available for folks to acquire and make part of their collection and art objects that they can wear. Wear. And, and yeah. objects that they can use. <laughs> right. So I, I want you to tell me something. Tell me, how did you start doing this? Well, I've been stitching for close to 40 years. I okay. started doing needlepoint because my mother did needlepoint oh. and then just quickly started doing more experimental things and then dropped the canvas that needlepoint is on most of the time because then I could do more with it. The, the dyeing came about more recently because I've always had this quest for doing something to the fabric before you even start stitching, so that you have interest there that you can pick up on. I have this little piece of fabric that is naturally dyed, and actually I used purple sweet potatoes. That's um, very lovely, very organic. I love your palette. This very and so, yeah, this kind of coloring. And I'm just waiting. I did this a while ago. I'm waiting for it to speak to me and say, okay, this is what you need to do with this. So, you, you spoke about the fact that you use, you, you use natural um, products, organic elements to create your palette. What, you use red onions? Tell us I, about the onions. The onion skin, um, and it doesn't really matter what color, just because I'm using that purple onion, I'm not gonna get a purple dye out of it. Oh. So you usually get a, a rich golden dye that if you add a little iron to it, you start getting a more amber color, or you can take it to green sometimes. Um, and then I use avocado and we use the skins, which I dry. And thank God I love avocados. <laughs> so, yeah, I do too. <laughs> peels are always drying on my windowsill. So there's a, there's a bit of chemistry in this whole process then. 
I sure wish I had paid a lot more attention. <laughs> yes, I'm learning a lot more about chemistry because the mordants are more about chemistry. Indigo is very um, pH oriented, but so are a lot of the natural dyes. You can change the color by changing the pH of the dye bath. So interesting. Kind of an experiment, but avocados act give a pinky, peachy, sometimes beigeier tone, not a green. Interesting. Oh, like the flesh is yellow, but not anything like you think it should be. And it's always a little different, which is what I like about it. So can you just recap one more time for the audience, I'd like to know your items that are available, just specifically. Just okay, I'm going to have silk scarves, and some of them are long, and then I have large squares um, in various patterns. Uh, I'm going to have the little Japanese handbags. I have a lot of uh, napkins, different sizes. Um, and I have a few tablecloths. They're obviously a more ambitious project because they're right. bigger. Right. I have some frame things that are going to be there. Um, the mixed media fiber collages. And then I will have this hanging, for instance. This is one thing I did during this. I started during COVID, early COVID. And it Tell us more about this particular work. What is that work about? Does it have a specific meaning? It does to me. It is, um, it's going, it's the first piece in a new series I'm doing called Time Warp. And this is called um, The First Wrinkle. Okay. And I feel like with so many things <laughs> with COVID, we've learned a lot about what we are not prepared for, the cracks in our system, the wrinkles that we've been working on smoothing. Um, and there's just a lot of complexity in here. So I like that a lot. That's very beautiful. So we you. have just a few more minutes. Do you want to um, tell us anything else? What would you like the audience to know that will be re in reviewing your work and purchasing your work? We're gonna claim it for the MPA Art Fest. Right, um, I just am somebody who is very enthusiastic about what I do. I'm um, getting older. And so I keep going and my- You're getting work better. <laughs> We're both getting better, go ahead. <laughs> Like it gives me every day, there's something, there's a reason for getting up and starting. Okay. It was a little depressing for a while when everything was being canceled because you thought, why should I make more work when I have all this work? But it was so nice when y'all decided to go forward. I had such a great time last year and I felt like I met a lot of people. And I'm going to miss not having a lobster roll for lunch. But <laughs> <laughs> it did meet people, and it was a beautiful day, and the presentation of everything was so great. But this is a whole new kind of adventure, and it's a learning process for me. Well, and I'm very happy that you're continuing to make work because I feel that artists have play a very strong role in this historical moment, as uncomfortable as it is. But the ability for you to continue to create shows resilience on your part and what you're made of and your creativity. So I love your work and I cannot wait to view it on the virtual website. Hello, our, our next artist is Julie Lansaw Warren. How are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this, Cheryl. Well, I want you to you know, tell us, the audience, a little bit about yourself. 
Okay. Um, I am trained as a painter uh, originally. I'm from Iowa. Okay. I, I then, uh, after I got a degree in painting, I decided to get a, gra a graduate degree in illustration. So I went uh, for a two years master fine arts program and really was interested in um, kind of combining the narrative of the written word and the visual. The visual. So I did that. Uh, I was a where freelance- Where are you located artist. now? You're from Iowa, but where are you located now? Uh, I'm in, uh, just outside of DC. I'm in McLean, Virginia. Okay. I've been here for quite a while. So tell me about your practice so the audience gets an understanding of where you are now in your practice and what, what is that defined as? What mm -hmm. does that? So I, I do my paintings in acrylic and I try, I do them in a lot of layers so that I can talk more about that later, but I do them in a lot of layers so that I hope the, the final looks more like an oil painting, which is okay. That's painting. hard to achieve. A little bit harder. <laughs> so, what is your subject matter mostly? I, I'm looking at beautiful landscapes behind you. Um, They're mine in the back. Um, I really love the landscape and everything that has to do with the landscape. Sometimes a seascape, sometimes a skyscape. Um, a lot of times. Um, sort of house-like or barn-like structures make their way in. And maybe that has something to do with my origin of the Midwest and Iowa, very pastoral um, is what I'm familiar with. But I'm really, really sort of concerned with light. I'm concerned okay. with composition. Uh, and I think having the icon of the barn or a house element, A, it's very comfortable. A lot of people can identify with it. And it gives me gives the painting a little bit of structure instead of just um, alternatively just having a, a beautiful green pastoral landscape with a beautiful blue sky. So where do your concepts come from? Do you use photographs? Do they come from life? Have they places that you've been to? Tell us a little bit about that that's, process of your thinking. That's a great question. I really try only to paint places I've been. Um, with few exceptions, I will um, take a lot of photographs when I travel, when I um, am traveling for fun or for or for, to try to get photographs um, for, to paint. And I always, almost always, work from my photograph, my own photos. So and you said that you paint from places that you've been, so you rely a lot on your memory of that place. And yes, that's that's a good point. And the feeling. So a lot of a lot of time, it's a lot of times it's how I'm feeling. And I think we all agree we we're pretty happy when we're traveling, right? So those are usually good memories, and it's pretty easy to to relive that feeling when I'm trying to put it down on canvas and recreate that three dimensional feeling and sense on a two dimensional canvas. So I'm intrigued about your um, interest in how you focus on the light. Can you tell us a little bit more about your thinking on that? Um, a lot of people out there probably know the light is the worst in the middle of the day. It's the best at the very beginning of the day and the best towards the end of the day. So I like, I like how light can create the volume and help with the three dimensionality of it. Because as I said, where you're trying to recreate this three dimensional space on a two dimensional surface. So you have to be very wily about how you let the viewer feel that space. And a lot of it has to do with light. So if, if there's an egg with just a, a spotlight on it, it's gonna have a harsh shadow if you're if you put that same egg next to a window with soft light it's going to have a beautiful um a beautiful transition from the highlight to the shadow to the to the um the dark side of the egg and it's much easier to show that three dimensionality with and certain what, types of what light what time of day do you think that you see that type of light oh i have you seen it mostly yeah the best time of 
day for my paintings is late, late afternoon. Like There's golden a, light. Right, right. right. That. It's remarkable. You, you can. I just, see it in that painting. That's why I was looking at that. I said, she's dealing with light and she's dealing with that golden light that happens momentarily in the afternoon and you've captured it beautifully can you now tell us what works will be available upon the virtual festival this year that's a great question um i believe we're allowed to put up 10 paintings i right. have probably 40 paintings so i'll have to just <laughs> sort of select a variety of uh of sizes and prices and but all, but everything you see is is available so okay and i'd like to you to tell us more about the larger work back there with that golden light that's in the back behind the frame painting can you talk more about that where that what that is referencing what place so cheryl that's that's funny that you picked that one out that one really <laughs> doesn't have a photograph or a specific place. So um, part of the reason it's here is because I've never put it up for sale because I just am not quite sure that it's ever finished. Maybe because I'm so reliant on working from my photographic reference. Um, but that one was sort of a compilation of all of this, all of the sort of skyscapes and marshy, sort of landscapes um, that I see a lot on the Eastern Shore. I spend a lot of time on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, so it's very flat and a little bit of marshy, marshy grasses. Very beautiful. And I can see, because I'm a painter as well, I can see that you work in layers. Can you talk to us about that process? Um, this is kind of interesting. If you look at this, this painting. Right, right. <laughs> The first thing I do is something that a lot of old masters do with their paint, did with their paintings, and they tone the canvas this sort of um, sienna color. Right. And right. for the longest time, I used to tell my students that they toned it sienna color because it was the opposite of green, as you know, on the spectrum of color. But right. then I read that this color, the sienna color, is real, it was really, there was a mineral that was very, very plentiful and it was very cheap. And that's how the, that's why the painters toned their canvas with that flat color um, and then put the colors on top of it. Because if you think about a white canvas, if I put a blue, put the blue color on a white canvas, it would look dark but it's not really a dark color. You know, it has a lot of pigment, a lot of, a lot of brightness to it. Um, so that's one of the reasons I paint that way is to sort of give myself a, a, a medium base. So when I do put the colors on top, they sort of sing. Okay, okay. Is there anything else you want us to know about your work and about you that we haven't covered? Hmm. Um, I taught with the Corcoran College of Art for about 17 years. Did you really? <laughs> I did. Always, always part-time. I taught some painting classes and I taught a lot of illustration classes. Okay. And then, um, of course, they're no longer. But I really had a great time teaching and that's how I got involved with McLean Project for the Arts. They used to um, code share classes with the Corcoran out in McLean. Okay. So, okay. Um, and so um, you are a full-time artist now, making beautiful, beautiful work. Um, yeah. Oh, I do have something I want to point out that's kind of new. Good. Good. Um, oh, there it is. This painting. In the frame? Right. Uh, oh. Let me see if I can bring it closer. Yeah, do that for us. That is something. This painting uh, came about because I started teaching some painting classes. And when I, when I had beginners in, they obviously were very nervous about starting. So I started by letting them choose a, a, a picture to paint. And then I gave them little rags to paint with huh. 
and no paintbrushes. So this was my demonstration that I did for them to show them how you could paint without a brush. And I think and blend. I, I want, I'm, I'm doing more of them, but, but part of the fun is that you can only get so specific with a, with a little rag instead it's of so paint. soft and it's so lovely. So That's it's really, it creates a really softer look. So. Yes. Well, I look forward to looking at your work um, on the website and in our virtual fair. And I thank you for being with us today. And I thank everyone for watching us and listening to the artists and their incredible work. And I hope that you will go to our website, visit it and purchase. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>